Torture by Francois Joseph Le, Mer Le Mercier. He is a Jesuit priest who learned of the the Huron um, like lifestyle. On the 2nd of September, 1636, we learn that an Iroquois prisoner had been brought to the village of Omnantisati, and that they were preparing to put him to death. This savage was one of eight captured by them at the Lake of Iroquois, where there were 25 or 30 of them fishing. The rest had saved themselves by flight. Not one, they say, would have escaped if our Hurons had not rushed on so precipitately. They brought back only seven, being content to carry off the head of the eighth one. When the prisoners had arrived in the country, the old men to whom the young men on their return from war leave the disposition of the spoils held another assembly to take counsel among themselves as to the town where each individual prisoner should be burnt and put to death, and the persons on whom they should be bestowed, for it is customary when some notable personage has lost one of his relatives in war to give him a present of some captive taken from the enemy to dry his tears and partly assuage his grief. Another one who had been destined for this place was brought by the captain Endit Sakoni to the village of Omnestisati, where the war chiefs held a council and decided that this prisoner should be given to Saundaus Koi, who is one of the chief men of the country in consideration of one of his nephews who had been captured by the Iroquois. This decision being made, he was taken to Arontain, a village about two leagues distant from us. At first we were horrified at the thought of being present at this spectacle, but having well considered all, we judged it wise to be there, not despairing of being able to win this soul for God. Charity causes us to overlook many considerations. Accordingly, we departed. The Father Superior, Brebuff, Father Garnier, and I together. We reached Arontain a little while before the prisoner, and saw this poor wretch coming in the distance, singing in the midst of thirty or forty savages who were escorting him. He was dressed in a beautiful beaver robe, and wore a string of porcelain beads around his neck, and another in the form of a crown around his head. A great crowd was present at his arrival. He was made to sit down at the entrance to the village, and there was a struggle as to who should make him sing. I will say here that up to the hour of his torment we saw only acts of humanity exercised towards him but he had already been quite roughly handled since his capture. One of his hands was badly bruised by a stone, and one finger was not cut off, but violently wrenched away. The thumb and forefinger of the other hand had been nearly taken off by a blow from a hatchet, and the only plaster he had was some leaves bound with bark. The joints of his arms were badly burnt, and in one of them was a deep cut. Meanwhile, they brought him food from all sides, some bringing saga mite, some squashes, and fruit, and treated him only as a brother and a friend. From time to time he was commanded to sing, which he did so with much vigor and strength of voice, that considering his age, for he seemed to be more than fifty years old, we wonder how he could be equal to it especially as he had hardly done anything else day and night since his capture, and especially since his arrival in their country. Meanwhile, the captain, raising his voice to the same tone used by those who make some proclamation in public places in France, addressed him to these words, My nephew, you have good reason to sing, for one... For no one is doing you any harm. Behold yourself now among your kindreds and friends. Good God, what a compliment. 
All those who surrounded him with their affected kindness and their fine words were only so many butchers who showed him a, a smiling face to treat, only to treat him afterward with more cruelty. <clears throat> In all the places through which he had pa passed, he had been given something with which to make a feast. They did not fail here in this act of courtesy, for a dog was immediately put into the kettle, and before it was half cooked, he was brought into the cabin where the people were to gather for the banquet. To see the treatments they accorded him, you might have thought he was the brother and relative of all those who were talking to him. His poor hands caused him great pain, and smarted so severely he asked to go out of the cabin to take a little air. His request was immediately granted. His hands were unwrapped, and they brought him some water to refresh them. They were half putrefied and all swarming with worms, a stench arising from them that was almost insupportable. Meanwhile, he did not cease singing at intervals, intervals and he continued to give... And they continued to give him something to eat, such as fruits or squashes. Seeing that the hour of the feast was drawing near, we withdrew into the cabin where we had taken lodging. We were greatly astonished and much rejoiced when we were told that he was coming to lodge with us. The Father Superior found him so well disposed that he did not consider it advisable to postpone any longer his baptism. He was named Joseph. In the evening of the next day, he made a feast at which he sang and danced, according to the manner of the country, during a good part of the night. Okay, then the next morning, which was the 4th of September, the prisoner again confirmed his wish to die a Christian and his desire to go to heaven, and he even promised the father that he would remember to say in his torments, Jesus Tatanir. Jesus, have pity on me. They were still waiting for the captain, Saudi Skoe, who had gone trading, to fix upon the day and the place for his torment, for this captive was entirely at his disposal. He arrived a little later. Saudi Skoe looked at him pleasantly and treated him with incredible gentleness. This was a summary of the talk he had with him. My nephew, you must know that when I first received news that you were at my disposal, I was wonderfully pleased, fancying that he whom I lost in war had been, as it were, brought back to life, and was returning to this country. At the same time, I resolved to give you your life. I was already thinking of preparing you a place in my cabin, and thought that you would pass the rest of your days pleasantly with me. But now that I see you in this condition, your fingers gone and your half hands half rotten, I changed my mind, and I am sure that you yourself will now regret to live longer. I sh shall do you a great kindness, greater kindness, to tell you that you must prepare to die. Is it not so? It is the toe. <sighs> toe. Tenras, the clan who injured him, who have treated you so ill, and who also caused your death. Come then, my nephew, be of good courage, prepare yourself for this evening, and do not allow yourself to be cast down through fear of the tortures. Thereupon Joseph asked him, with a firm and confident mind, what would be the nature of his torment. To this, so this guy replied that he would die by fire. That is well, said Joseph, that is well. While this captain was conversing with him, a woman, the sister of the deceased, brought him some food, showing remarkable solicitude for him. This captain often put his own pipe in the prisoner's mouth, wiped with his own hands the sweat that rolled down his face and cooled him with his with a feather fan <clears throat> about noon he made his a 
that is his farewell feast according to the custom of those who are about to die. No special invitations were given, everyone being free to come. The, the people were there in crowds. Before the feast began, he walked through the middle of the cabin and said in a loud and confident voice, My brothers, I am going to die. Amuse yourselves boldly around me. I fear neither torture nor death. He straightway began to sing and dance through the whole length of the cabin. Some of the others sang also and danced in their turn. Then food was given to those who had plates, and those who had none watched the others eat. The feast over he was taking back the feast over he was taken back to Arontain to die there. Meanwhile, the sun, which was fast declining, admonished us to withdraw to the place where this cruel tragedy was to be enacted. It was the cabin of one at sun, who is the great war captain. Therefore, it is called Oti Non Siskage Undane, meaning the house of the cut off heads. It is there all the council of war are held as to the house where the affairs of the country and those which relate only to the observance of order are transacted. It is called Endion Ra Undon, House of the Council. We took, then, a place where we could be near the victim and say an encouraging word to him when the opportunity occurred. Today, eight o'clock in the evening, eleven fires were lighted along the cabin. The people gathered immediately, the old men taking places above, upon a sort of platform which extends on both sides, the entire length of the cabin. The young men were below, but were so crowded that they were almost piled upon one another, so that there was hardly a passage along the fires. Cries of ro joy resounded on all sides, each providing himself one with a firebrand, another, another with a piece of bark, to burn the victim. Before he was brought in, Captain Anans encouraged all to do their duty, representing to them the importance of this act, which was viewed, he said, by resenting to them the, um, by the sun and, and by the god of war. He ordered that at first they should, be, they should burn only his legs, so that he might hold out until daybreak. Although, also for that night, they were not to go and amuse themselves in the woods. He had hardly finished when the victim entered. The cries redoubled at his arrival. He is made to sit down upon a mat. His hands are bound. <clears throat> then he rises and makes a tour of the cabin, singing and dancing. No one burns him at this time. But also, this is the limit of his rest. One can hardly tell what he will endure up to that time when they cut off his head. He had no sooner returned to his place than the war captain took up his robe and said, O Tundi, speaking of the captain, will despoil him of the robe which I hold. And he added, The Atakon Kronans, a certain clan, will cut off his head, which will be given to Odesson, with one arm and the liver to make a feast. Behold his sentence thus pronounced. After this, each one armed himself with a brand, or rather a piece of burning bark, and he began to walk, or rather run around the fires. Each one struggled to burn him as he passed. Meanwhile, he shrieked like a lost soul. The whole crowd imitated his cries, or rather smothered them with horrible shouts. One must be there to see a living picture of hell. The whole cabin appeared as if one, as if on fire, and althwart the flames and the dense smoke that issued there from these barbarians, crowding one upon the other, Hulling at the top of their voices with firebrands in their eye, hands, their eyes flashing with rage and fury, seemed like so many demons who had have given no respite to this poor man. They often stopped him at the other end of the cabin, some of them taking their, his hands and breaking the bones thereof by sheer force. Others pierced his ears with sticks, which they left in them. 
Others bound his wrist with cords, which were tied roughly, pulling at each end of the cord with all their might. Did he make the rounds and pause to take a little breath? He was made to repose upon hot ashes and burning coals. As for myself, I was reduced to such a degree that I could hardly nerve myself to look up to see what was going on. After he had reposed a short time upon the embers, they tried to make him arise as usual, but he did not stir, and one of those butchers, having applied a brand to his loins, he was seized with a fainting fit, and would never have risen again if the young men had not been permitted to have their way, had been permitted to have their way, for they had already begun to stir up the fire about him, as if to burn him. But the captains prevented them from going any further, and ordered them to cease tormenting him, saying it was important that he should see the daylight. They had him lifted upon a mat, most of the fires were extinguished, and many of the people went away. At the end of an hour he began to revive a little, and to open his eyes. He was forthwith commanded to sing. He did this at first in a broken and, as it were, dying voice, but finally he sang so loud he could be heard outside the cabin. The youth assembled again. They began to talk to him. They made him sit up in a word. They began to act worse than before. For me to describe in detail all he endured during the rest of the night would be almost impossible. We suffered enough in forcing ourselves to see part of it. Of the rest we judged from their talk, and the smoke issuing from their, his roasted flesh revealed to us something of which he, we could not have borne the sight. One thing, in my opinion, greatly increased his consciousness of suffering, that anger and rage did not appear on the faces of those who were tormenting him, but rather gentleness and humanity, their words expressing only raillery or tokens of friendship and goodwill. There was no strife as to who should burn him. Each one took his turn. Thus they gave themselves leisure to meditate some new device to make him feel the fire more keenly. They hardly burned him anywhere except in the legs, but these, to be sure, they reduced to a wretched state, the flesh being all in shreds. Some applied burning brands to them, and did not withdraw until he uttered loud cries, and as soon as he ceased shrieking they again began to burn him, repeating it seven or eight times, often reviving the fire, which they held close against the flesh by blowing upon it. Others bound cords around him, and then set on fire, thus burning him slowly and causing him the keenest agony. There were some who made him put his feet on red-hot hatches and then press down on him. You could have heard the flesh hiss and have seen the smoke which issued therefrom rise even to the roof of the cabin. They struck him with clubs upon the head and passed small sticks through his ears. They broke the rest of his fingers. They stirred up the fire all around his feet. But, as I have said, what was most calculated in all and all this to plunge him into despair was, was their raillery, <clears throat> and the compliments they paid him when they approached to burn him. This one said to him, Here, uncle, I must burn you. Afterward, this uncle found himself turned into a canoe. Come, he, said he, let me cock and pitch my canoe. It is a beautiful new canoe, which I lately traded for. I must stop all the water holes well, and meanwhile he was passing the brand all along his legs. Another one asked him, Come, uncle, where do you prefer that I should burn you? And this poor sufferer had to indicate some particular place. At this, one, another one came along and said, For my part, I do not... From, for my part, I do not know anything about burning. It is a trade that I never practiced, and meantime his actions were more cruel than those of the others. In the midst of this heat, there were some who tried to make him believe that he was cold. Ah, it is not right, said one, that my uncle should be cold. I must warm you. Another one added, now as my uncle... Now as now as my uncle has kindly deigned to come and die among the Hurons, I must make him present. 
I must give him a hatchet. And with that, he jeeringly applied to his feet a red-hot hatchet. Another one likewise made him a pair of stockings from old rags, which he afterwards set on fire, and often, after having made him loud cries, all right, uh, he asked him, And now, uncle, have you had enough? And when he replied, Ona, Chotan, Ona, yes, nephew, it is enough, it is enough, these barbarians replied, No, it is not enough and continued to burn him at intervals, demanding of him every time if it, if it was enough. They did not fail from time to time to give him something to eat, and to pour water into his mouth, to make him endure until morning. As you might have seen at the same time, green ears of corn roasting at the fire, and near them red-hot hatchets. And sometimes, almost at the same time, they were giving him the ears to eat. They were putting the hatchets upon his feet. If he refused to eat, indeed, they said they, do you think you are the master here? And some added, for my part, I believe you were the only captain in your country. But let us see, were you not very cruel to prisoners? Now just tell us, did you not enjoy burning them? You did not think you were to be treated in the same way, perhaps... perhaps you thought you had killed all the Hurons. One thing that counseled us was to see the patience with which he bore all this pain. In the midst of their taunts and jeers, not one abusive or impatient word escaped his lips. Let us add this, that God furnished to the Father Superior, Brabuff, two or three, four, three or four excellent opportunities uh, to preach his holy name to these barbarians and to explain to them the Christian truths. No, no, retorted some of them. He is one of our enemies, and it matters not if he goes if he go to hell and if he be forever burned. The father replied very appropriately that God was God of the Iroquois as well as that of the Hurons. But do you think, said another, that for what you say here and for what you do to this man the Iroquois will treat you better if they could some time to ra ravage our country why are you sorry added, added someone that we tormented him I do not disapprove of your killing him but of your treating him in that way what then what do you French people do do you not kill men yes indeed we kill them but not with this cruelty what do you never burn any not often said the father all listened very attentively except some young men who said once or twice come we must interrupt him there is too much talk and they immediately began to torment the sufferer he himself also entertained the company for a while in the state of affairs in his country and the death of some hurons who had been taken in war he did this easily and with a countenance as composed as any one there present would have shown. As soon as day began to dawn, they lighted fires outside the village to display the excess of their cruelty to the sight of the sun. The victim was led thither. The father superior went to his side to console him and to confirm him, him in the willingness he had all the time to die a Christian. He recalled to his mind a shameful act he had been made to commit during his tortures, in which all things rightly considered there was but little probability of sin, at least not a grave sin. Nevertheless, he had to ask God's pardon for it, and after having instructed him briefly upon the remissions, remission of sins, he gave him conditional absolution and left him with the hope of soon going to heaven. Meanwhile, two of them took hold of him and made him mount a scaffold six or seven feet high. Three or four of these barbarians followed him. They tied him to a tree which passes across it, but in such a way that he was free to turn around. There they began to burn him more cruelly than ever, leaving no part of his body to which fire was not applied at intervals. They burned his eyes, they applied, applied red-hot hatchets to his shoulders, they hung some of his around his neck, which they turned, uh, which 
which they turned now upon his back, now upon his breast, according to the position he took in order to avoid the weight of this burden. For he attempted to sit or crouch down, if he attempted to sit or crouch down, someone thrust a brand from under the scaffolding, which soon caused him to arise. So they harassed him upon all sides, that they finally put him out of breath. They poured water into his mouth to strengthen his heart, and the captains called out to him that he should take a little breath. But he remained still, his mouth open, and almost motionless. Therefore, fearing that he would die otherwise than by the knife, one cut off a foot, another a hand, and almost at the same time a third severed the head from the shoulders, throwing it into the crowd, where someone caught it to carry it to the captain Odesson, Undeson, for whom it had been reserved, in order to make a feast therewith. As for the trunk, it remained at Arontain, where a feast was made of it the same day. They commended his soul to God and returned home to say Mass. On the way, he, we encouraged a savage who was carrying upon a skewer one of his half. We encountered a savage who was carrying upon a skewer one of his half-roasted hands.